This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at thebatmanuniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Hi, this is Jim Lee, and you're listening to the Batman Universe Comic Podcast. Hi, I'm Dan Jerkins, and you're listening to the Batman Hi, Universe. Hi, this is Scott Snyder, and you're listening to the Batman Universe Comic Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of the Batman Universe Comic Podcast. I'm your host Dustin and today I have with me... This is Steph. And this is Ian. And we are here to do episode 281 of the Batman Universe Comic Podcast, which covers the weeks of September 1st through September 14th. We have a total of two books to cover as usual, a little bit of news, and a bunch of other things that will take up a bunch of time for you to listen to us. So... Uh, I'm going to dive straight into it because there's a good chunk of stuff to cover this time around. So, first up, when we get into comic news, uh, right before we record, of course, as the last couple episodes and months have happened, uh, we've we've realized that this is not going to change. But solicitations released right before the episode um, post, or you know, we we're here to record. And while we'll have the full breakdown of the solicitations on the next episode, we do have the three big news related items that were announced um the first one was announced on september 10th dc has announced that suicide suicide squad will be relaunching with the new series from writer tom taylor and artist bruno redondo a lot of the team may look the same as the last incarnation but there are also a number of new members which will be making their way to the series as well uh, taylor revealed a few details in an interview with heat vision uh specifically when asked on what makes this book different than the past he responded for a long time there's been a sense of safety around suicide squad the anti-heroes and villains have gone out on a mission fought dirty won dirty and most of them have come home in our book that's not the case anymore the team we send out in an issue one won't all live through the first mission. DC characters with years of history are going to be confined to history after issue one. Truly, no one is safe. There is a new regime, and the new regime sees this team as assets and nothing more. They don't care if they lose them in the field. They can always get more, and they do get more. Alongside fan favorites like Harley Quinn and Deadshot, all new characters are going to be debuting in this book. New powered people are coming, and they don't want to be there. This is the most divided the Suicide Squad will have ever been. The missions will be hard, but surviving each other may be the hardest of all. Um, I I applaud him, but then uh, somebody specifically asked, or then another question was asked, on whether or not the creation of new characters is just a shield for the existing characters. Um, He specifically said, Why create new characters to be cannon fodder when you have a list of established kill?" characters you can kill off ha 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 one of the main things i do want i i want to do with this series and editors brian cunningham and andrea shea are with me 100 percent is to push the idea of these actually being suicide missions no reader should know what to expect when picking up this book we don't want anyone reading our series and thinking well they can't die because they're in a movie no one is off limits here new characters and some more obscure established dc characters offer us a chance to have real stakes if someone dies in our team they're not coming back uh, right uh we want readers going in yeah with the tell sense- me that when deadshot dies he's yeah. coming back whether you do it or not man yeah. and they're not killing hartley yeah we want readers to go in with a sense of nervousness. Yes, there will be some despair for our team, but the victories will be sweeter. When and if they survive, it will feel big. 
Um, and then specifically when asked what other established characters to expect in the series, he said, we'll absolutely see some more obscure villains. We'll see some very early on. I have a list of more I want to use if, say, unfortunate things happen to some of them. We have Cavalier, who I think is ridiculous, but the squad needs ridiculous. Shark, Zebraman, who has great unique powers. Magpie, who've, who I've always associated with that first team up of Superman and Batman and others. Um, and then besides Harley Quinn and Deadshot returning the team, obviously there's a number of other Batman villains, like he mentioned, that will be, that will be playing into the series as well. Um, the first issue will hit stores on December 18th with a special 40 page issue priced at $4.99. Um, it will be $3.99, 32 pages normally, but the first issue will be oversized. Um, and Conveniently, all the characters he mentioned that will be part of the team are all on the first cover. So I would expect, because one of the things he keeps pushing online is that don't expect all the members of the team to live through the first issue. And I have to say, it'd be very, very doubtful, like we've mentioned earlier, that Deadshot or Harley are going to die. Um, but we actually have seen Deadshot die multiple times in Suicide Squad. Uh, and then he miraculously reappeared reemerges from the grave um i'm not going to sit here and say that tom taylor is you know he's not serious when he's saying he has every intention of killing characters off there's and someone with a lot of experience killing off characters it's yes definitely that is game. yeah but uh the the thing is the thing that i have an issue with is you know, it's completely understandable if that's the intent going in the book. And trust me when I say that'll make a good series because you're going in, you're seeing the obscure villains. I would be interested just to seeing the obscure villains popping up. Um, the one thing that, of course, that bugs me about this is the inclusion of Harley Quinn. And the reason why is because why is Harley Quinn in this book and in Birds of Prey? And they're both coming out at the same time. It just doesn't work like the whole point of her well, being did you the, notice that birds of prey number two was not not solicited, solicited. For December? yeah i don't know why uh that, that, again weird stuff totally because uh, she's gonna die in suicide squad <clears throat> i don't know I, I the thing is it just it bugs me because like i get that harley quinn's a popular character there's no deb- denying it i thought it was kind of ridiculous how she needed to be in suicide squad um in the first place during back during the new 52 uh, but they were clearly trying to go a different route with the character at the beginning of the New 52, and that's why she was on the team. As time progressed, and then she ended up getting her own solo series, and that series was going in a completely different direction than the way she was appearing in Suicide Squad, it made no sense other than to have her on the team, of course, when the New 52 version, or uh, the Rebirth version of the series launched, because of course, when she, the team, when the, when the book relaunched, it was right when Suicide Squad, the movie came out. And of course, they're going to have her on the team. I don't understand why she stayed on the team. Um, it completely contradicted everything that was going on in her own series. And while some people will say over and over again, well, that's not really part of her series isn't really part of main continuity. Then why does it exist? Why, what is the point of it existing the way it does if the whole, if it's not in continuity? And it is. It's just, it's like some far off version of it. The fact that she can somehow be in Suicide Squad and she's in her own solo series, you know, we've chalked it up to, okay, fine. They're just, that, that it's just two different versions of the character or whatever. But now you've got a book debuting in November that is Birds of Prey. And for some, idiotic reason a month later she's in another team book there's just it doesn't make any sense like i get that harley quinn is showing up in birds of prey the movie i get that now we 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 know because of a reveal this past week that she will also be in the new suicide squad film but i just don't get it this is what happens when you start using the character a little too much and then people start to get sick of her um, and I'm not saying that it's going to happen like next month or six months from now, but she's got her solo series. She's now appearing in two different team books. It just doesn't make the character work. Like when Batman appears in all these books, sure, he's a part of the Justice League, but most of the time the stuff isn't contradicting other things happening. I say that, of course. I say that, of course, knowing what's going in Tom King's book and Detective Comics and Justice League and knowing that it all contradicts. I understand that. 
Um, I mean, even if you look at something like um, Dark Side War, I I think that didn't really mix with what um, Scott Snyder was doing in the New Fifty Two. I think that Justice League and Batman have not really lined up for at least ten years, maybe even twenty. I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree, but uh, my only argument for that is that the Justice League books are their own little group and the Batman books are their own. And while I'd love to believe that Birds of Prey is part of the Batman group of books because it should be, I doubt that it is um, because Red Hood isn't part of the Batman books. Uh, it's headed up by a different editor who's more in charge of the, the DC uh, the DC team books. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I get it. There's There's the character can can pop up more times than they really need to but should they no i don't really think they should but that's that but on the plus side i am kind of curious to see what they do with some of these other characters like cavalier magpie and zebra man um because why not i mean if anything, it just gets them to the forefront. Magpie is supposed to be popping up in Batwoman at some point in the near future, too. So It is a little bit of a shame, and I'm surprised you didn't say anything, that that they're finally using existing characters, and they're only bringing them in to kill them. Well, we don't know that they're... The, the thing is, what's interesting is that Taylor revealed two new characters. I think there was a third one he revealed this or this morning or over the weekend or something, but I think he's got some new characters, and of course, whenever there's new characters, you automatically assume, well, those are the characters who are going to die off, and there's a character oh, called Wink, who is literally looks like Harley Quinn, and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, what was the point of creating a character that looks like Harley Quinn? And then I realized, well, it's probably to kill him off, and then of course this interview comes out, and he's saying, no, 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 that's not the case. And I could see him trying to blend some of his newer characters, at least make you care about the characters or interest in the characters before killing them off. But the fact that he says Cavalier is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I wouldn't bank on Cavalier making it out. very. <laughs> he might be one of the first ones to go. Um, because let's be honest, he is just the guy with the sword. Oh, I really like Cavalier, though. I'm he not had a really I, great Tim Sale story. I'm not saying like, that nice. he, I'm not saying that he's a bad character. It's just like let's be honest here. If someone's gonna go, it seems like he's more likely the the, the one to go. Um, it will be interesting because the other part of it is like you look at a character like Cavalier or Magpie or Zebraman, and these characters, while they have had you know one off appearances here or there, scattered all over the place, Magpie is the only one who has a remotely future a remote future when it comes to media because she's popping up in the batwoman tv series but outside of that like nobody's talking about cavalier or zebra man so the thing is like if these characters get killed off no one's gonna care but they are established enough where it will get people talking where it'll be like oh holy crap they're killing off this character who's been around for 60 50 years so like for that aspect of it, I'm completely fine with because while I don't believe they'll always stay dead, and that's ultimately the biggest problem with this and obviously every other comic book that is out there, whenever you kill off a character, it's just a matter of time before they come back. Uh, and unless Tom Taylor has this grand plan of like being able to reset some of the deaths that occur... That's his intent, is just to leave him off the table for as long as possible. And by using established characters that nobody ever wants to play with or use, it, it would work perfectly where they're going to be dead or gone for an extended amount of time. So, I wonder if that was like a mandate, like, okay, we're tired of people asking us to use established characters, let's just get rid of a whole bunch of them. Yeah. And... I, I honestly, I wouldn't put it past them because I feel like the, the biggest problem with Suicide Squad, in my opinion, at least back when, the, right before uh, it ended earlier this year, because the last issue was in January, when that when that all happened, I felt like nothing of importance was ever happening in the book. Like, sure, somebody would die, but it was always a character that I had never heard of or somebody like that. And I know that, obviously, the the obscure villains that are now part of the team, at least in the in the first issue, are Batman villains, and that's why I know them. But, like, 
if I've never even heard of the villain, I don't care about the villain. And if you don't spend any time building up a character and then killing off the character, I also don't care about the character. It's just like, mm-hmm. they're there. They have no purpose. For a while, at the beginning of Rebirth, I think they they tried to introduce some new characters. Like, there was that character, Hack, um, that ended up dying and then, like, was their spirit or soul was in, like, the internet or, I don't know, it was... It's kind of weird stuff, but the thing is, like, I they really tried to make some of it work, but there was just certain things that, like, you could tell full on that there was no way a lot of these characters were going to die, and it was because they were using the roster from the movie. And now, while we don't know the roster exactly from the upcoming movie that's coming out in 2021, it's a far enough out where, you know, they can rework the roster down the line, and who's to say that Taylor's actually going to stay on the book for a year and a half? You know, I would hope that he wants to and he has the the intent to, but you can't ever say that someone's going to stay on a book for that long. So, yeah. All right. So next up on September 12th. Uh, so in November, we didn't really talk about it here because it wasn't Batman related. But um, if you paid attention to the Batman Who Laughs, the series that obviously we did cover on the site, that series spun out into Batman Superman, which is now Batman and Superman dealing with the infected, as we have talked about in the past, the Secret Six. And the Secret Six were revealed, um, spoilers, uh, through spoilers by, of course, by DC Marketing, um, because I I don't know why they they can't put it, they can't stop themselves. But anyway, in November, there's two one-shots coming out. Uh, dealing with two of the characters, and then there's two other issues that are tying into main series um, that will also deal with two of the six. So the four of the six are getting a focus in the month of November, and then come December, the final two, which are Donna Troy and James Gordon, Commissioner Gordon, will be getting a one-shot as well. So um, if you are not paying attention to what's going on, well, then this isn't going to matter to you, but as you, if you haven't paid attention to the Batman, uh, who laughs, you know that James Gordon was infected at the end of the series or was revealed to be infected. Um, and he is now one of the six. And come December, his story will be told in The Infected, The Commissioner Number One by writer Paul Jenkins and artist Jack Herbert. Uh, while the full solicitations were not released at the time of this, uh, announcement, they describe the story as um, about a hero whose sense of duty and honor is stripped away, a man who has finally given in to his worst impulses, and he might just take the entire city into darkness with him. Um, it was also revealed in the announcement that the fallout from the event will take place in Year of the Villain, Hell Arisen. This is a four-issue miniseries that will be written by James Tynan with art by Steve Epting. Uh, both the Commissioner Gordon One-Shot and the first issue of Year of the Villain, Hell Arisen miniseries will arrive in stores on December 18th. Um, and there's a cover for the One-Shot by Victor Bogdanovic. And, uh, Bob Danovich. Danovich. Okay. And, uh, that is available over on the site for you to check out. Um, to be fair, I, I'm really on the fence when it comes to all of this Batman who laughs stuff. Uh, Scott Snyder's not heading it up anymore. He's taken a step back. Uh, the story's playing out by Joshua Williamson over in Batman Superman. And then these one shots that are going to be, uh, popping up in November and December. They're bun- done by a variety of different art uh, writers and artists uh, that have not been linked to any of the dark multiverse stuff up to this point. Um, the the one problem I have with stuff like this is that this does feel like another Scott Snyder idea that is being executed by somebody else. And while let's just say there's not the best track record with things like that happening. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because I don't know. Let's be honest here. Okay. Let's just go back in time and say, okay, let's talk about court of owls. That was a really cool story that really worked. Snyder did a great job and this fallout from it was talent. 
which Tynion was on for a while and he did a great job with it but then eventually he left on he left to do something else and then the series completely fell off and Calvin Rose is a character that nobody even probably knows unless you were reading comics specifically during that time frame because he's never gone back to the character Similarly, they did the, uh, when they had the super heavy storyline with Bruce Wayne not as Batman and they had James Gordon as Batman, they did the detective comic story, um, which focused on, uh, Jim Gordon working with the police in Gotham City. And to be fair, I'm not sure a lot of people even remember that story unless you were reading comics during that time because it wasn't really, it wasn't a story that was super popular. Um, in my opinion, I know it sold well, but I honestly, if you didn't read comics back then, how many people actually would remember or know that Jim Gordon was Batman for a almost year long? Um, not many. And Mr. Bloom was probably the one thing that came out of it, but ultimately that villain, in my opinion, was horrible, but... Yeah. Bloom was a terrible villain, but Jim Bats was awesome and people should read Super Heavy. I, uh, there, there's parts of Super Heavy that I think were really good. I think the villain was really bad. I think that the behind the scenes stuff with Bruce Wayne was interesting, but there wasn't a lot of it. Um, meaning like what he was up to while he wasn't Batman. Uh, they didn't really focus on that much of it. Um, and I felt like they could have. But the Jim Gordon as Batman, it was, it was an interesting story to tell with Jim Gordon. And, I agree that part of it was really good. It's just a lot of the other stuff around it did not do so great. I think a lot of people initially scoffed at the entire, uh, the bunny suit as it was called. Um, so yeah, it's one of those things where will it be remembered? Probably not. Um, but this is, this to me just feels like another one of those things where someone comes up with an idea and it's really popular, sells really well, and DC says, how else can we maximize this popularity? <clears throat> Joker's not I'm, I'm really, really upset about this because Jim is one of my favorite characters. Um, and I think making him a villain, we all know it's not going to last because Jim Gordon has retired before and came back and got younger. So we know Jim's going to be back. Um, so there's no real tension in that. And I'm not against knowing that it's going to happen. I mean, I knew Batman was going to be back, um, you know, when Batman Incorporated and in uh, Super Heavy. But I still really like both of those stories. I am just so tired of these evil versions of heroes or infected versions of heroes. We've had nonstop evil Batman since 2017 for two and a half years. It's just been evil Batman, evil Batman especially Batman Who Laughs, but there, there's too many evil versions of heroes instead of using the villains we have. We have plenty of villains who can be evil, and you, you don't need to make evil versions of hi of heroes to, to make stories. I, I really don't like this move. I really don't like this storyline, and I wish they would wrap it up. But I... I have a feeling that we're just going to keep going and going because Scott Snyder's doing another event next summer. Yeah. Which, of course, goes back to the same characters. So. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, the next bit of story that we have, and the only the last story, is that uh, on September 13th, The Dark Knight Returns is uh, returning in a one-shot form. Uh, the Dark Knight Returns, The Golden Child. Uh, this is going to be written by Frank Miller, and he handpicked artist Raphael Grandpa uh, to be, do the art for the story. And this will be the first time Grandpa has returned to comics uh, in six years. Uh, the story takes place three years after the events of Master Race, where Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Carrie Kelly, and Laura Kent overcame the renegade priest Quar and his cult of Kandorian fanatics in their bid to convert humanity into worshiping, worshiping them as gods. During this interim, Laura has spent time learning about what it means to be human while Carrie has grown into her role as Gotham City's new protector, Batwoman. When a terrifying evil returns to Gotham City, Lara and Carrie team up to take on this new threat, but this time with a secret weapon, 
Jonathan Kent, known as the Golden Child, Jonathan possesses power unlike the world has ever seen and could be all that stands in the way of the destruction of Gotham City as well as the whole planet. Uh, DC has also announced that the 48-page one-shot will have a main cover and a variant cover by Grandpa, as well as a as well as numerous variants by a variety of other artists, including Paul Pope, Joel Jones, Andy Kubert, and Miller himself. Uh, the issue will be printed under DC Black Label, priced at $5.99, and hit stores December 11th. So, um, are we? Are any of us surprised that uh, we're getting more DK returns? No. Nope. Yeah. It always sells very well. It does. I'm not surprised, but I'm really excited. I um, actually went back and reread all of Dark Knight 3 Master Race as a result of this announcement, and I really enjoyed it more because I read it all at once instead of every three months or however long. It took a really long time to come out. And yes, it did. I actually went back and listened to Dustin, Ed, and Stella's episodes where they reviewed the last three issues. Um and I want to give Dustin props for saying Frank Miller would be back. He was absolutely right. Frank Miller is back. And um, I, I'm i not usually a fan of Grandpa's art. It's uh, a little too much like Chris Burnham and Frank Quitely, which I know those are really popular artists, but they're not my, uh, they're not my taste. They're very good, but they're not my taste. But Grandpa's preview art and the cover are really cool looking. And I'm really excited about this idea um, – a following up on the character of Wonder Woman and Superman's son. And I'm usually not a fan of Wonder Woman and Superman being together, but Frank Miller doesn't convince me of it, but he does make me interested in it. Um, also, I'm a huge fan of Carrie Kelly, and he said that she's going to be a pretty big character in this one shot, so that's exciting news for me. I went and checked because he's also writing a Carrie Kelly standalone graphic novel with Ben Caldwell doing the art. And Ben Caldwell said he's working hard on it, posted some some work in progress. So that's also happening. So Dustin was 100 percent right on predicting that Frank Miller would be back. And it looks like we're going to get a lot of Carrie Kelly out of this, which is good news for me. The one, the one thing I have to say is like, well, to be fair, if anybody listened to our DK three reviews, I wasn't a huge fan of the series in general, um, but um, I can see the desire to keep returning to it. Um, obviously, from a sales perspective, it sold really well, despite the fact that you know there was a lot of delays and the issues were spaced out a little bit longer than they should have been um the sales were very very consistent and sold it sold really really well so i'm glad to see that dc is going back to something that people actually prefer to buy um which is fine there's nothing wrong with that uh but the real plus here is that it's a one shot because instead of having a mini series that's going to have <laughs> three to six issues and we're going to have to wait a year to a year and a half to actually get all of the issues out. It's just a self-contained story that's releasing and by having it already solicited, I would assume by every measure that is measurable, this book is already done. Um, it's not a matter of, oh, it's, 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 uh, we, we, we were like halfway done. We've got three months to get done. No, I'm pretty sure that this is done, which would, which is great because them it's releasing on time and not to mention it's a one shot the last one shot frank miller did the last crusade was really good and it was a self-contained story i think that's really a good format for miller these days yeah and the plus side is it's not like while it's a one shot it's not super crazy overpriced uh 5.99 is pretty on par with what any 48 page story is going to be nowadays so um you know, I'm not complaining about the price. I'm not complaining about the page count. I really, at this point, don't have anything to complain about. Um, I also am not a huge fan of Grandpa's art. Um, and honestly, looking at the proportion, the exaggerated proportions that are on that cover of Carrie Kelly in the Batwoman suit is not exactly going to be my cup of tea. But um, I'm just, I guess I, I'm optimistic about the fact that uh, it could be a self-contained story. And I do agree the 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 last crusade was actually really good so um yeah here's hoping we get something that is not hindered by the fact that it's released over a long period of time so 
All right, so with that, that is all the news we have. As I mentioned, the solicits are out, and as you're listening to this, hopefully I'll have the uh, breakdown of the entire group of solicits up on the site. But in the meantime, um, we do have some new comics to talk about, some of which were really good and some of which were not. Um, one of which and one of which. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll let you decide which one, or you could probably just take a guess. Um but yes, spoilers. We're dive it's in. Batman. Yeah, uh, we're gonna dive into our comic reviews, and we're gonna start off with Batman. Batman number seventy-eight. Writer Tom King, artist Clay Man, colorist Tomu Mori. The issue opens with a flashback to nineteen forties Batman number one, where Batman is bandaging a captured Selina Kyle's ankle. The issue then flashes to the present where mustachioed Bruce Wayne and Selina Kyle kayaking through a tropical ocean. Selina asks Bruce how he feels, and she responds that she likes how he lies when he says, I am fine. As they go ashore and lie on the beach, Bruce asks Selina what he wants her to say. And again, he says, I am fine. Selina states that she believes him, and now it's Bruce's turn to call out Selina for lying. The two then get a drink at a resort, uh, where it's revealed that they are staying under Bruce's Matches Malone identity. As they sit on the beach, Selina asks Bruce what they are, and Bruce responds that it doesn't matter. Uh, She's asking about whether he used the alias, whether they were a married couple or not. Bruce then speaks about how the one thing that can defeat Bane is coming to the beach, and in the meantime, Bruce is training and recovering from his injuries. The two go rock climbing in costume as they talk about how Selina still has the ring that Bruce gave her, and the two share a quiet moment at the top of the cliff. As the two sleep in separate bedrooms, they talk through the thin walls about how Selina knows Bruce is still awake because of his breathing. Bruce again states that he is fine, and Selina again calls him a liar. The two then stand in costume on top of a waterfall before diving into the water below. As they surface in an embrace, they almost kiss before Selina says no and swims away, leaving Bruce to pull his cowl back into place. Bruce and Selina sit in front of a fire and talk. Selina tells Bruce that she used to think about a future where they grow old together before saying that while she left him and she thought she was doing something heroic to give the world Batman, if it had truly been an act of heroism on her part, she wouldn't have wept afterward because heroes don't have those kinds of selfish desires. Bruce admits that he waited and wept too. Batman and Catwoman then face each other on the beach as the sun rises, or sets. Catwoman tells Batman to throw his batarang as if he means it, whipping it in his direction. Catwoman tells Batman to throw the batarang like he's angry, trying to goad him by saying that she, he should be angry at her for making the decision for both of them that cost them their relationship. Batman throws the batarang into the sand, saying no telling her that Catwoman didn't do this to him and she was responding to his beliefs about himself. Batman speaks about believing that he needed to be alone to be Batman, stating that after being brought so low, he realizes it is not their pain that makes them alive, but that they live to fight the pain and admits to Batman that he is not fine. The two kiss as the sun sets. They have one flirty exchange saying, it's not settled, and the issue ends on another kiss. So, um, I feel like longtime listeners will know that I thought this issue was truly amazing. Um, I'm not going to hide the ball on that at all, but what are your impressions? How did you feel about this issue um, just as a whole? And then we'll get into some specific questions I have about content. Well, surprise, surprise, I don't have a lot of rants for this issue. Um, that's a good thing. 
uh, for those of you <laughs> keeping track at home. Um, this this was a really good issue. Um, this is the Tom King that I enjoy reading, and this is what makes me really, really look forward to the Batman Catwoman series coming in January, is stuff like this. Uh, he's always written these two characters really, really well, and their interactions together just... Oh, man, it's good stuff. And... This is why I enjoy what he's doing, even though it seems like I'm constantly complaining about what he's doing. Um, but it, this is the reality. I mean, like, he knows what he's doing. He he has a good grasp on both of these characters. And this just continues to further cement the fact that hopefully, because he gets these characters, he actually has them end up together. Um yeah, I, I honestly don't have a lot to complain about this time around because this was a good issue and I really, really liked it. Yeah, I liked it too. Um, the p- art was just gorgeous. And I'm not just talking about like fan service, although there was a lot of that for both genders or both both uh, <clears throat> you know groups of people who like certain genders. But um, yeah, it was just gorgeous and just finally seeing them talk th- things like – I think that's been one of my pet peeves is just like so much is happening and they're not talking about it. And I think that's one of the reasons I like the nightmares as much as I did is because we finally get to see Bruce work through some stuff. And here we get to see them work through it together. Like she's finally back and they're talking and she's she, they're both lying to each other because their body language obviously isn't matching what they're saying. Um, and so it's just been it's interesting seeing two people who've spent their whole lives hiding themselves talking about what happened and what fans were so upset about what was it a year year and a half ago when when the wedding didn't happen i don't know it was it was nice seeing some of the issues addressed and talked about in such just gorgeous gorgeous setting i don't know why they're in hawaii (laughs) i don't think i caught why why it was so important that bane wouldn't know that they were on the beach train i mean the real reason they're in hawaii is because clay man's favorite tv show is magnum pi magnum pi yeah that was not hidden in this at all (laughs) but in terms of plot reasons i have no idea why no idea maybe we'll find out but i'm okay if we never find out because hawaii is awesome but yeah really really gorgeous like my dad used to say if you don't if you didn't complain about dinner he enjoyed it (laughs) and there's definitely not a lot to complain about in this issue well, I want to sort of dig into this issue because it's full of, of references, not just to Tom King's run, although there are some really good ones. Mm-hmm. But it opens with that, that reference to Batman number one. And I realized I'd, have, I'd never actually read Batman number one. Um, so I went back on DC Universe and read the one story. It's actually like seven stories. It's a huge issue. But I read this Catwoman story in Batman number one, and it's a really good story. There's a couple of things that uh, Steph and I agree. Uh, Would we're not glad. fly in today's Yeah, society. Batman threatens to spank Catwoman for some reason. But uh, He calls himself daddy. It's so awkward. It, it's, it's not a thing that I'm eager to see again. But um, I, I really like the way he's bringing that back. Because if you read it, the Batman Catwoman relationship is all there in that one issue. You've got the mm-hmm. um they're both in disguise, they're both uh torn by these strong desires. At the very end, Batman is clearly attracted. I mean, he's engaged at that point to Julie Madison, but he he finds Catwoman incredibly attractive and, and lets her go deliberately. Robin questions that. It's uh it's so fascinating to me that Tom King used that story as a key moment. He's done this in uh, Batman number 44 and Batman number 69. And so 78 is the the third time I think we've seen this. And of course he referenced it way back with um, Rooftops and then number 24 where he proposes and it's the diamond from the boat. Mm -hmm. So that reference I think is incredibly meaningful because it's, is very much about their relationship and how Tom King, I think is, honoring that relationship of Batman loving her and letting her go instead of, you know, pursuing her like all crime. He's, she's like the exception to his vow. Um, Another thing, because uh, Selena always says that they met on the street, and that's a reference to Batman year one. And I was also rereading parts of Batman year one and David Mazzucchelli, the artist for Batman year one wrote a really fascinating note in his afterward for that, that story, which 
by the way, is my very favorite Batman story. Um, he said that Catwoman represents a maturity that the boys, Batman and Robin, are not ready for. And that, I think, is really key to what Com King's doing. Batman and and Robin are boys who are responding to trauma. They're frozen in in the trauma of losing their parents or, or whatever trauma drove whatever particular Robin to become Robin. And Catwoman represents a way forward, uh, a maturity. Um, and it's not that Batman doesn't have a family. He's a father to, to Damien and Tim and Cassandra and Jason and Dick. He, he's a father to all those people, and I think that's a real family. But there is a different kind of... Um, growing that you have to do when you have a romantic partnership of commitment that that you see in a marriage or a committed relationship. And Catwoman is that representative for Batman. Um, And I think that the reason the boat street argument is so important is because of that tension between the the trauma and just the sort of uh, delayed maturity that's represented by being a vigilante and just punching problems to make them go away, and the maturity represented by having to deal with with Catwoman, someone who is a criminal but isn't evil. Um, so Batman has to to figure out how to fit her in his worldview, fit her in his vow, figure out if he can be more than just the vow. Um, there's also a great reference. I don't know if Steph caught it because she did such a great job when we reviewed Batman number 66. But, um, sorry, no, it was 67. Uh, the falling issue where it was Batman mm-hmm. falling from a skyscraper. Oh. I thought that the Batman Catwoman jumping from the falls was a reference to that because they end up in water just like they did in issue number 67. Um, and I think that's very much symbolic of the way Batman and Catwoman are are coming up. She is helping him find the way up after Bane brought him so low. Um, So I was wondering, what do you guys think of all the references? This this is just such a reference rich uh, issue. So did any of them really stick out to you? What did they mean to you? I wouldn't say that any of them specifically stuck out more than the other. I knew that there was lots of references and I'll be honest I love when history is referenced. Um, if Stella was here, of course, she'd say the history. The history. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Um, but, I mean, that's the reality of it is these characters have such a rich history, whether it be from the 1940s, whether it be from the 1980s, whether it be from just the last couple of years of his own run. These characters have such a, such a, such a rich, rich history. There is no reason you shouldn't figure out a way to reference the history that is existing. Um, and that is something that is extremely important to be seen because it acknowledges not just your own writing, but it acknowledges all the creators who came before you who have molded these characters into becoming what they are today. So I think that by, re- by having all of these references, it shows that he has not only a great understanding for the characters, but also a great respect for all of the creators who have worked with these create characters in the past. So for that, I, I greatly appreciate what he's doing here. Um, and like I said, I don't have any specific references that uh, stuck out more than the other. I just knew there was, it was this entire issue was rift with them. Yeah, some of the quotes I actually looked up because I was kind of hoping they were like songs or or whatever. But then I realized, oh, they're they're quoting their letters to each other at the very very beginning of the run. You know, when the I am I am suicide run. Um, but yeah, I think it. You know, as much as we, you know, don't like how how certain things get forgotten or happen in off panel land, like it is it is really satisfying to see okay you haven't forgotten what you've done like tom king hasn't forgotten where these characters came from like like dustin said but he's no also these characters are still who they were at the beginning of tom king's run but this is where they are now this is how it's either changed or stayed the same for these characters or or and it's just it makes it a richer more personal experience i think like we're getting to know batman i think on a level that no one's ever really delved into i mean i'm again i'm still a newbie but i'd be surprised if there is 
such a long, such a deep look at, at who Batman is. Um, and it's just, I don't know, I feel like I'm getting to know Batman, and it's it's just cool as a new fan to, to have that experience. Um, well, I mean, this is my like favorite said, Batman the- run, so I agree with you on that. <laughs> but I think that, um, to be fair to someone like Scott Snyder and Grant Morrison, both of them had you know, 50 plus issues. And even though I disagree with what they did with Batman, you got to know that Batman, you got to know Grant Morrison's Zen master, and you got to know Scott Snyder's great improviser. But with Tom King, we're getting to know Batman, the, the man who's trying desperately to grow beyond the trauma that caused him to become Batman. Do you think that's what he's doing in this one? Or do you think this is more he's moving past the trauma that caused him to be Batman? Well, he can't ever move past it because he's always going to be Batman. But I think he's going to grow to include more in his life than that. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, So let's get to our ratings. I mean, what do you guys think this should be? Um, So this is as close to a perfect as I can give. But as many people know, I don't hand out perfects, so I'll give it a four and a half out of five. I've been kind of keeping track. I think I've had the same score as Dustin for like the last few months, but I have to agree. Four four and a half. I am also going to give it a four and a half out of five. Truly stellar issue. And over on the site, Paul actually gave it a five out of five. (gasps) Uh, But that's going to give Batman a total of four and a half out of five batterings. So we'll move into our next issue, Detective Comics. Detective Comics number 1011, written by Peter Tomasi, art by Christian Doucet. We begin an hour and a half in the past with a strained Bruce heaving the hull of Hiroshi's plane from its resting spot. Bruce states that he'll gladly answer any questions the two men have, but first he needs their help um, for one final mission. As they begin to hatch their plan, Bruce emerges himself in a pool of mud, citing that villains are a cowardly lot and that fear is a great asset to him. Clarence muses that some things never change. We then fast forward to current events where Deadshot is lining up a kill shot for the running Bruce. However, Deadshot didn't anticipate that this mass crusader may have help. Using the remains of Hiroshi's plane as a wrecking ball, Clarence and Hiroshi strike. Clarence inside the plane while Hiroshi uses a rope to harness a rope harness to launch the assault. They are successful smashing into Deadshot and knocking him off his feet while Bruce tends to the CEOs. After ensuring they're okay, Bruce rushes back to check on Clarence and Hiroshi. He discovers that Hiroshi's been dealt a deep blow, but not before getting Deadshot first. Bruce wants to tend to his wounds, but Hiroshi urges Bruce to continue the fight. Next, we cut to a fleeing Deadshot, frustrated with the proceedings so far. Without even a noise, he calls out for the Masked Crusader, knowing he is nearby. Bruce appears, and then they begin to quarrel, each appearing on even ground. Deadshot decides to use a vine to strangle Bruce, using a nearby tree for leverage. Bruce snaps the vine and delivers a decisive uppercut, ending the battle. We see the next morning and how Alfred was able to follow Bruce's transponder and come to their aid. Next, we see Bruce say his farewells to the boys he'd met, ensuring that Hiroshi is healing well. He leaves them a comm link for further communication. This is followed up on a few days later when Batman flies in using his bat plane to drop off a care package for the boys. Inside, they find a vast variety of books and foods. They laugh to themselves, very pleased with the delivery. Finally, we return to Gotham Pines Barrens, where Mr. Freeze is giving a dossier on Nora Fries to a a couple of rugged men. Uh, We learn that they are to tranquilize specific targets that will each be used for their specific characteristics. All right, so um, we get an issue that uh, does not feature Mr. Freeze at all on the cover, finally. Um, that, that's good to see. Um, well, he's on the top, isn't he? No, no, he's, he's not even on the, or he's, he's, uh, the, the top itself has, it features villains, but there's, it just is, it just part. It's just a blue villain who kind of looks like him. Yeah. It's, I think that's Lex Luthor, but, um, oh. <laughs> Oops. um, 
Well, I mean, red eyes, bald head, and you're not far off there. Um, no. Okay, so here's the thing. I I didn't dislike this issue as much as the last one um, because it just, one, it wrapped up. But two, um, the biggest thing is I feel like this, again, we got three issues of this story. And ultimately, what was the point? Deadshot was supposed to take somebody out. Bruce thwarts Deadshot's plan, and Mr. Freeze is kind of just hovering in the background, and we don't know where it's going, although it is coming up very soon. Um, so three issues to do basically Deadshot gets thwarted by Batman. That's my biggest issue with this. There's no real reason for it. There's no real purpose for it other than just to take up space. And that seems to be the case with Detective Comics since 1000. I really thought we were going to be going into a new era of Detective Comics where we would actually get stories. You could argue since 981. That's true. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Because you could go back further and say... Everything that's happened since Titan has left the title has all just been taking up space. And that's my main problem. Um, While this specific issue, like I said, was not as bad as the last, it just doesn't feel like any of the stuff that's happening in this book matters. They try to make some of the stuff seem like it matters, like the introduction of Arkham Knight and then the reveal of who Arkham Knight is leads to nothing. And while the character may appear in the future at some point, uh, it's very unlikely at this point because they're going into the story with Mr. Freeze. Um, Tom Taylor's coming on the series for a single issue in December. Uh, it just, and then January, we're going from shipping twice per month to shipping once per month. So the likelihood of them picking back up on that story, I just, I just don't see it. Ultimately, I just, I just feel like I'm wasting my time reading this series. And that, that that's the part that is frustrating to me is while I'm all for, you know, standalone stories and things like that, there's so much stuff going on in the DC universe to have this book not connect. At least this would be the perfect title to connect to the greater DC universe stuff. Um, because Tom King is telling his own standalone story within the pages of Batman. So have this one tie into some of the events that are happening in other titles or, you know, deal with the year of the villain stuff. Um, and right now it just feels like it's, it exists and that's the extent of it. It needs to exist because it's, you know, got over a thousand issues. So it's going to keep existing because of that. And that's the part that just bugs me. Nothing that's happening in this series makes a difference or matters. Um, nothing is when, when Peter Tomasi was announced to come on this book, obviously I was, I was pretty pumped for it and I thought we were going to get a lot of family moments and we've gotten a couple here or there, but for the most part, it's just, it's become another, let's tell Bruce randomly dealing with some person. First it was the Arkham Knight, then it was the Spectre. Now it's this. It's just, I don't, understand the thought behind doing what they're doing with the series and that's what's so annoying thoughts well what makes it even more sad is that it started actually the first issue i really enjoyed the first two i loved where it was going i liked the setup i liked how they were doing bruce but it just kind of (laughs) like it just seems to kind of fall apart after such an interesting setup and I think that's the last few. The last few arcs, I think, have been like that. Where was the one where? Where? Anyway, it doesn't even matter. It just seems like the first issue gets me gets me excited, and then yeah, it just kind of lets you down. And and all the complaining about the motivations of the characters in the last issue, well, it kind of just it was just whatever. Like they were bait just because the 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 hostages became bait because suddenly. Deadshot saw a dude he didn't know, and he's like, aha, now they're bait. I'll get you. He doesn't even know who he is, and even though he's got bad ears for some reason. Right, and it still is <laughs> not, never It's never explained it's why ne- Batman would just be on this island, why Deadshot was there, who Deadshot was after. Was it? Yeah. None, none of it. It's all just conveniently wrapped up because it needed to take up a certain amount of space, and that's yeah. really fr- frustrating. Like, normally, I, I'm not a big fan of what's the point hating on issues but in this case like not only it's like what not only is do we not know what the the point was it's almost hard to tell what the story was because it 
I don't know. It was so ambiguous. <laughs> like, talk about off-panel land. Like, this is, like, off-panel and on-panel. It's like, what? What just happened? I don't know. It was... It was I am more disappointed because they have such good setups in my... Or at least moderately good setups. And then, yeah, they just peter out. And And if there was at least some family moments... Like, even in this, Alfred saves the day and you don't even see Alfred. It's just, I don't know, disappointing. I, I really don't know what's going on because I liked this issue. Um, <laughs> and this perplexes me because everyone knows that I uh, I come into a Peter Tomasi issue with a fair amount of baggage. So the fact that I really don't have a problem with his ending. I mean, Dustin's right. It's not going anywhere. But I... I still like Chuck Dixon's Detective Comics run, you know, and that was mostly issues like this where you had like, oh, what was that, Gunhawk and Gun Bunny shooting up a, a bank and Batman stops them. Like that was the story, and I just really enjoyed a, a good one or two shot arc, and that's basically what this. Deadshot takes a bunch of people hostage. You get some Bruce Playboy action. You got some Lucius Wayne. You got some, I mean Lucius Fox. But that was all some... the first issue, though. Well, but Lucius like, was a pretty was big part of this issue, I think. Mm. I don't know. I feel like he, he did a good stuff in, in this issue. He and Alfred. Um, I, I I agree. It's not doing anything fascinating, but it's it's a well-constructed little story with a really weak second part. <laughs> but I, I think the ending was, was nice and satisfying. The little bit where Bruce you know sends supplies to the two guys who wanted to stay on the island was really nice. I thought it was a good moment. Um, I don't know. I, I have My no real problem with that? this. Was that I was like he just he just sent these crates to these two ninety year old men and he expects them to open the crates. They're I hardcore. I was like, what? <laughs> they should have had buttons on the side that just opened the crates. Sorry, that was me thinking like an octogenarian. <laughs> I don't understand why. This is going to be a, a petty thing, but why exactly would two guys want to stay on an island after they were there for their entire lives, yet have the ability to have communication with the outside world or outside of their world? I don't understand that. Like, I get that, like, they have been there for a long time. They have made this their home. This is their life. I get that part of it. But, like, by introducing all this stuff that they didn't have before contradicts the reason of why they're staying in there in the first place if they're content with the way their life is why do they need all these books and all these all this extra food and supplies and why do they need a comm link to be able to contact batman in in in, in the case of a you know some random situation like i understand the idea of why batman does it but why would they need any of that stuff if they were content with where they were if they weren't content with where they were, then why would they stay? Why wouldn't they? Why would if they weren't content? Why would they stay on the island? That's I just. I, <laughs> I thought about that and I was like, well, you know, a lot of their questions to Bruce and a lot of the things they asked about were were small things. And it's like, yes, they may be content, but it's okay to ask questions and and be curious and maybe miss a few creature comforts. Like you don't want to go back to live in civilization just because you want an Oreo cookie, like. I don't know. I, I think it's 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 giving them the little bit that they missed and they and they had expressed an interest in in the last few years of their life. Yeah. Like I said, it's a petty thing. I just <laughs> I don't get it. But yeah. So um I'm honestly gonna leave it at that because I don't really want to spend more time talking about something that I really disliked. I had one little question. Go ahead. Are we to understand there's like Six Nora Frices, or were they talking about body parts? And like they had to tranquilize the different body parts. I, I was under, I was not understanding what the multiple targets were when they all had one dossier. I assumed oh, were they were trying to find things for something for her. No, I didn't think it was body parts. Uh, I thought it was like, oh, these are you know she doesn't have a personality, so we're gonna go get her. <laughs> Different. I, I mean, I don't. I don't think that's it. But we also know from the acetate cover in coming in November and some of the future covers that Nora Fries looks nothing like Nora Fries um, in the future, and she's like some kind of crazy 
rogue villain um, after being, you know, unthawed. So, I don't know. I, I just want them to get to the Mr. Freeze stuff so that we can get to the Mr. Freeze stuff. I don't understand what the necessity of having, like, these small, like, lead-ins every single issue if... I mean, I know it's right around the corner. I know it's coming. It's just I don't understand why we just spent the last three months doing what we just did. Um, when, to be honest, it's this book still has the Year of the Villain uh, banner at the top of it. And other than the you know two pages at the end that are tying into it, it has nothing to do with Year of the Villain. Other than it's just Batman fighting a villain, which, oh, wait, that happens all the time. Not during a special event. So, yeah. So, like I said, it, this issue by itself is not horrible. It's just, it's very average for me. I don't have any quorums with the overall conclusion of the story, other than we still don't know who hired Deadshot, why he went after uh, the CEOs, what the reason he was doing it was, how no one in their right mind put it together that Bruce Wayne was Batman since he was the only <laughs> other person on this island. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, obviously, there's a lot of unanswered questions that, let's be honest, are never going to get answered. But, yeah, uh, I'm going to give this two and a half. I'm struggling with, because if I was giving it, like, a personal rating, like, this didn't go where I thought it should go, I would give it a two. But, you know, I have to live with the fact that, you know, the world doesn't revolve around my expectations. So as a story, ugh. Two and a half. Three out of five. All right, and over on the site, Jamie gave it three and a half out of five, so it's going to give Detective Comics a total of two and a half out of five better aims. That is all of our in-depth reviews. Let's jump over to the site for Greater Gotham. Starting off on September 4th, main TBU books, Harley Quinn number 65. Harley escapes to a volcano jungle in an attempt to run away from the grief of her mother's death with only one test in her trials left to pass. This is by David. He gave it four out of five. Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy number one lying low after the events of Heroes in Crisis. Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy find themselves unwillingly called back to service when the Floronic Man comes knocking at their door. This is by Scott. He gave it three out of five. Secondary TBU books, Batman number 181, Fast Mail Edition. Female super criminals fight over who's the number one, only for a fourth wheel to claim the title. This is by H. Ham. He gave it three and a half out of five. Batman vs. Ra's al Ghul number one, as Batman struggles to save a Gotham ruled by chaos, the city's leaders appeal to the demon's head for help. This is by Donald. He gave it two out of five. Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number three or three, number five. It's a battle royale as everyone tries to take down Krang's army. A recovered memory pushes Batman to seek out additional help. This is by Adele. He gave it two and a half out of five. Main DC Universe books, Doomsday Clock number 11. After losing all U.S. heroes at to the atmosphere of Mars, the Trinity is finally engaged in the global crisis. Meanwhile, Vite reveals his plan to save his own reality. This is by Jessica. She gave it three out of five. Justice League number 31, as our heroes travel through the past and future, could a newly formed alliance be the catalyst that tips the scales in Doom's favor? This is by Andy. He gave it four and a half out of five. Secondary DC Universe books, Deathstroke number 47. Robin Damian Wayne makes a brief appearance in the issue. Legion of Superheroes Millennium number one. Batman Terry McGinnis, Harley Quinn, Deadshot, and Killer Croc all appear in the issue. Lois Lane number three. The question Rene Montoya continues to play a role in the series. Superman up in the sky. The Joker makes a brief appearance in the issue. The Green Lantern number 11, Emerald Knight which is the Batman of Earth 32, appears in the issue. Moving over to September 11th, we have main TBU books. We already talked about Batman number 78. Batman and the Outsiders number 5. Black Lightning, Caliber, and Katana infiltrate Kadum uh, uh, to extract Sophia. Meanwhile, Signal and Orphan deal with a sneak attack. Subaya Dull, he gave it 3 out of 5. Batman Universe number 3, The Hunt for... 
The egg brings Batman to Thanagar and Gorilla City and eventually to Dinosaur Island. This is by David. He gave it three and a half out of five. Catwoman number 15. Catwoman faces the consequences and the gainings of having stolen a file that, that can compromise all of the crime families of Villa Hermosa. This is by Jessica. She gave it four out of five. We already talked about Detective Comics. Gotham City Monsters number one. The lives of the monsters of Gotham City are about to intersect as a force is summoned. This is by Theodis, he gave it three out of five. Riddler, Year of the Villain, number one. Riddler has a midlife crisis and has to question the choices he has made. This is by H. Ham. He gave it five out of five. No secondary TV books. Main DC Universe books. Event Leviathan, number four. Superman's confrontation goes poorly. And the teams pursuing Leviathan collide. This is by Ian. He gave it three and a half out of five. Young Justice, number eight. Still lost in the multiverse. The Young Justice now have to deal with the chaos that is Earth 3. This is by Jessica. She gave it four and a half out of five. Secondary DC Universe books. Black Hammer, Justice League, Hammer of Justice, number three. Batman appears alongside the Justice League. The Flash, number 78. The Trigger Twins appear on a screen in the issue. Justice League Odyssey, number 13. While still part of the core team, Azrael appears very briefly in the issue. Wonder Twins, number 7. Batman appears alongside the Justice League in the Hall of Justice. Finally, TBU trades and hardcovers from the past two weeks include... Batman Detective Comics Volume 1 Mythology Hardcover. Batman Damned Hardcover. Batwoman Elegy. Uh, new edition trade paperback, The Joker, His Greatest Jokes trade paperback, Catwoman Volume 2, Far From Gotham trade paperback, Batman Volume 10, Nightmares trade paperback, Batman Eternal Omnibus hardcover, uh, Batman Hush, the new, the new edition trade paperback, Batman The Killing Joke deluxe new edition hardcover. Uh, all those TBU trades and hardcovers, we do have links to order those straight from Amazon if you are interested in any of those. And then obviously clicking on those will help out the site as those are affiliate links. Um, let's talk about the books from the last two weeks. Anything stand out to you guys worth mentioning? Ian? Well, I feel uh, like most of the things I do on this podcast, everyone knows that I am going to say that Young Justice number 8 was amazing. Um, and it's not just, but it is largely, because Stephanie Brown of Earth 3, the evil dimension, shows up and is actually Batwoman in a very punk sort of... It reminded me a lot of um, Bluebird, Harper Rowe, in her costume. Um, I really like that. But I also thought that it was just a fun story. Uh, John Timms did a really, really cool fight scene with uh, Tim Drake versus his evil version of course, everyone was talking about the fact that Tim Drake's evil version calls himself Drake, and everyone thinks that this is going to be Tim's name going forward. I can see the argument for that. I'm not convinced, but I guess we'll have to just wait and see. Uh, but I, I just think this is still a fun title. I think that the the month we had off from Among Justice didn't do anyone any favors, but it's still a good book, and I would recommend it. Um... Doomsday Clock finally brought everything to rebirth, and it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> that was a little disappointing. Um, yum, yum, yum. <laughs> the Year of the Villain w was interesting in that, and I meant to say this about the Black Mask issue, is that it, it seems, and I think I mentioned this on the Discord, it seems that the gift the caveat is that the villain loses everything that makes them unique or makes them even their name. Like, Black Mask isn't head of the underworld anymore, and Riddler doesn't have his green Riddler hat anymore and doesn't do riddles. Like, it's it's going to kind of be... And it seems like, from what little we've seen, that, the that you know, what makes Dr. F or Mr. Freeze Mr. Freeze is, is, you know, his, his desire to save his wife. And if she goes evil and is a against him that then he's losing that part of his identity too so it's it's gonna it's an interesting concept but also like one thing that makes dc villains so interest or i guess uh, villains so interesting is their sh is their shtick and when you take their shtick away it's like uh what is, what are we doing i don't know it's it's going to be interesting that, that's something i feel like they could screw up very easily but if they don't it would be very interesting as far as the riddler one it was a good issue it mm -hmm. makes the riddler 
It almost brings the Riddler back to the way he was right before the New 52, where he went to become a private private detective just to prove mm-hmm. how smart he was <laughs> and not about the ridiculousness that was some of the prior, you know, to be fair, I honestly think that the Riddler regressed when Scott Snyder used him for zero year. Cause I don't think really Scott Snyder, like I get that a lot of people just assume the Riddler is really smart and he does this, but whenever they start introducing these ridiculous death traps and stuff like that, I don't think that that's the character. That's the version of the character that everyone just associates, but that's not the version of the character that I think a lot of people like or want to read about. Um, obviously that was a very popular version of the character in the Arkham games, but I don't think that anybody know. I, I think anybody who reads comics knows that that's not who the character is. That's the character that everyone just, that's like the version that is most commonly associated with the, the character, but that's not the one that at least the people in the comics uh, appreciate reading. But anyway, the Riddler one shot was really good. Um, a couple other things worth mentioning, at least from my perspective, perspective i actually thought that the harley quinn and poison ivy miniseries the first issue was really interesting because it kind of sets some things up um i also like the idea of there's continuous mention of things happening in other books which i appreciate because i want this character i want harley quinn to be more associated with continuity and while you're the villain there was an offer from Lex Luthor and all of that in her own, her own series. Nothing, nothing really seems like it matters in that book. Um, so I'm glad to see that there's a version of Harley that actually can exist in normal continuity. Um, the one surprise for me over the past couple of weeks was Gotham City Monsters. Uh, mostly because it was really on the fence on whether or not this book would be good or interesting. And while it seems slightly cliche that they're all just going to get together because they all happen to have somebody involved in a horrible thing that happened and that's how they come together. Um, I'm interested to see how these characters interact with each other. And if you read the first issue, one of the main characters slices another main character in half, which was pretty yeah. funny. So and I was like, oh. Okay, I thought that character was going to be around for a while. But I don't know enough about the character to know whether or not they can be around after after they get sliced like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, there was, there was a lot of really good stuff over the past couple of weeks. Um, there was nothing that I think was remotely, like, overly bad. I think there was a lot of stuff that was average. Um, I think Justice, or uh, not just like Doomsday Clock is really the letdown because so much time has passed in between some of these issues. And now um, we didn't mention this earlier, but doomsday clock number 12 is finally re- re- uh, has been solicited for December. So if you're keeping track here, that's uh, three months out that the next issue is coming. So here's hoping it actually releases in December and doesn't somehow get delayed. Um, Gary Frank had said on Twitter before they solicited the issue that they were really aiming to get the series the end of the series wrapped before the end of this year. And obviously that seems to be the case because they solicited the final issue. And with all the delays that have been happening, I'm not sure that they would have wanted to solicit it without having at least a uh, pretty good understanding that it's going to be wrapping up. But I think that the series, like while everyone initially when it started was under the assumption that it was going to have these major ramifications for the future of the DC universe, we've gotten to the point now where I don't think anybody cares. Like we want to see how it wraps up and there's the curiosity of how, you know, things will end up where they end up. But I don't think anybody's thinking it's going to affect all the other titles, which is really sad because I was really kind of pumped for what this could have been and what it has become is not at all what I've been wanting. So, yeah. It seems like even if, even if it had come out on time, if this is the story that was going to be told, then it just really kind of explains why. Like, it doesn't set anything up for the future or anything like that. It's just, it explains why we got Rebirth. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think there's also a real... I mean, I, I... No, I didn't say that yet. Um, 
the beginning of issue 11 clearly is part of three jokers because um it says gotham's in ruins and there's like three maniacs and clown makeup running around so that's clearly just a three jokers thing um so i think that's the closest we're going to get to doomsday clock actually mattering to any other comics um people have been saying this for a, a while that the idea of rebirth is great but spending 12 issues over three years trying to tell how we got rebirth is not a worthwhile use of energy Mm -hmm. it's certainly selling a lot and people i I definitely understand the craft involved in what johns and frank are doing but the story doesn't matter it's only been two is it oh yeah 2017 to 2019 it just That's, feels like three years. Yeah, <laughs> because the first issue came out in November of 2017. So when it's all said and done, it'll be just over two years since it's it, it launched. But yeah, yeah, it, it does it does feel like it's been a really long time. And it would have made sense to start it earlier when Rebirth actually launched, but whatever. All right, so outside of all of the comic reviews that uh, have released over the past couple of weeks, we also have a new Batman Through the Years, which deals with 1945, which uh, doesn't... 1945 was not a year that had a ton of stuff, but there is some stuff, so check that out um, over on the site. In 1946, should be right around the corner. Uh, before we get into our listener Q&As, uh, real quick, I want to thank our Patreon supporters, Robert, Donald, Brendan, Ian... D- uh, Austin, Stanton's Grave, Arturo, Captain America, J. Dunn, Real No Deuces, as well as everybody supporting us at the lower tiers as well. Uh, we greatly appreciate your support. Over the past couple of weeks, we have released a couple of new, um, some new content as, as far as what you can be t- taking a look at. Um, so if you haven't checked out some of the new content and you're a Patreon supporter, just definitely do that. Um, we did release um, a new TV Raw. talks about all of the DC comic imprints, some of the stuff that uh, we talked about briefly here on the comic cast, but we talked about... Uh, uh, Ian and I talked about it much more in depth. And then we also released a new TBU Extra, which is talking about uh, Robert Pattinson being cast as Batman and kind of our hopes for what the Batman film, the upcoming Batman film could be. Uh, I was joined by Paul and Scott from the site, and we talked about that. So those two are coming. That We also have new Cold Case coming soon, and well, as well as Phantom and Crisis and uh, a bunch of other stuff too. It's just a matter of getting it knocked out and released in the in the near future so uh with that being said if you are so inclined you can of course support us on patreon um if you are not looking to support every single month and you're looking for a one-time donation there is a link on the site to donate uh a one-time donation via paypal which can be used you can use whatever form of payment you want using paypal um but then if you are not so inclined to donate money to us uh and you have extra time or skills you'd like to dedicate to the Batman universe, we're always looking for new comic book reviewers, news writers, content creators, video editors, audio editors, graphic designers, website designers, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we have all kinds of projects that we really like to work on. It's just a matter of finding the right people to work with us or finding the, the right the ability to actually get some of this stuff done. So if you are so inclined, get in touch with me, tbu at thebatmanuniverse.net, and uh, we will figure out a way for you to help out with tbu. So with that being said, we're going to jump straight into our listener Q&As. Uh, we have a couple of ones. First one, before we get into the actual questions, I want to clear up some confusion. There was uh, a discussion on Discord about something that I said on the last episode, and I specifically said um, I was I was talking about how it was a little too convenient that the plane 
landed on the island after being struck by lightning. I want to conf- I wanted to clarify something that I said because there was some confusion. Some people were thinking that I meant it was a little too convenient that it was struck by lightning. Um, no, what I specifically meant was I thought it was a little too convenient that the plane was struck by lightning and then miraculously crashed on an island. That is too convenient. Um, it was, we pointed out on the last episode that planes get struck by lightning all the time and it's a, it's a common thing and they don't crash and, you know, crash to the ocean and miraculously end up on an island that is inhabited by two World War II vets. A little too convenient. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time talking about Detective Comics because I'm tired of talking about Detective Comics. So, our next comment comes from Zach, and he actually sent this uh, comment back on episode 279, but it was after we had already recorded 280. So, yeah, here we go. Yep. Zach says, are any of the podcast hosts currently reading Green Lantern? While asking questions regarding non-Batman universe related titles is typically discouraged, in Green Lantern number 10, there was a wonderful appearance by Bat Lantern of Earth 34. I was wondering what your individual responses were if you happen to look into it. Additionally, this appearance in Green Lantern led to an observation that may not... That may not be all that novel, but it's curious how frequently Batman-related doppelgangers and Batmen of the multiverse have come become commonplace in Batman u- in the Batman universe recently. During Grant Morrison's tenure, we had the Batman of Zurinar, the Batman of the future, and various members of Batman Incorporated. While I don't recall Scott Snyder elaborating on this idea in the main title, he certainly was with the Dark Knight medal, Dark Knight's medal. While Snyder has started that Last Night on Earth and All Star Batman are the same as the character are the same characters during his new fifty two run, one could argue they are also Batman variants. And of course, Tom King currently has Thomas Wayne occupying the Batman doppelganger role. It's a curious thematic thread running through all these individual arcs. Any thoughts on why this duality of Batman's double has become such a recurring narrative element during the last decade? Do you think this has any com- contemporary or social or political relevance what are some of your favorite batman of the multiverse or batman doppelgangers for example there is a particular elsewhere's batman that appeals to you and batman or a batman incorporated character you were especially fond of okay so there's a lot to answer here first Mm -hmm. off um i'm not reading green lantern but i am aware of the character you're talking about, which I have mentioned in the secondary DC Universe books over the past couple of months. I think it was not only 10, uh, it was 9, 10, and 11 that the characters appeared in. It's actually, the character is called um, Emerald Knight, and it's actually from Earth-32. And um, yes, I'm aware that the characters popped up, uh, but I don't have any super great knowledge of who the character is other than that's who the character is. Um, and I've mentioned it. Um, but the duality aspect of, or not duality, but the double or the doppelganger versions of Batman. Well, let's be honest. Um, the thing that makes the most sense is that if you can tell a version of Batman that is not Batman, doesn't have the same restrictions on the character as the normal main continuity Batman and you can tell something different, wouldn't you want to? Um, as a writer, it gives you the ability to do things you couldn't otherwise do with the normal main continuity character because you don't have to worry about all of the repercussions that changing continuity, you know, goes hand in hand with. So I completely see why a writer would want to tell different versions of Batman. Um, also, the other thing to keep in mind is while we have Dark Knight's Metal is, or Scott Snyder's version of that, Scott Snyder also did the other version of Batman, which was James Gordon. James Gordon was in the bat suit and he was Batman for a while too. So this is, this is something that happens fairly frequently in the, you know, the various characters. While obviously Tom King's is Thomas Wayne and that is a very different version of Batman. This tends to happen all the time, and then obviously you you throw in the fact that the version of Batman that's appearing in Justice League is not always the same version that's appearing in Batman. It is not the same version of Batman that's appearing in Detective Comics. This happens a lot, and really it just comes down to 
the creators want to tell their own version of the story and sometimes they don't want to be hindered by what everybody else is doing. Personally, I despise that and think that the editor should be reining these writers in to tell a story that is more able to coexist with the other aspects of what's happening in some of the other titles. Um, but yeah, that's my take on that. I'll get to the last part of your question after you guys have a chance to answer. Well, I mean, the obvious answer is that uh, Dustin posted a uh, highest grossing franchises of all time, 25 highest, in and, and Batman's on it, and Green Lantern is not. So part of it is Batman sells. It's as disgusting as it feels to say that Batman sells. So, and when you can't use the same Batman everywhere, because eventually people are going to revolt that the Batman literally can't be everywhere, which he is now, and we should revolt. But anyway, um, it makes sense to have, have these multiverse versions. And then, I mean, there's always the curiosity of who would Batman be if this happened? And I know that, that with Batman's will strength of will which is you know arguably his superpower it, it's amazing that he doesn't have a green lantern wing and ring and so and so having a batman with a green lantern ring makes makes total sense and should exist somewhere it doesn't exist in our universe but it should exist somewhere so i i, I do love that that the multiverse exists because you can just say well what if what if this happened who would batman be if this happened and then you end up with ugh, the older married with the tattoo batman who didn't even get any lines in in the Batman who laughs, but just ended up dead, and I I liked him instantly, even though he didn't even have it was dead. But um, yeah, Batman sells, and there's just too many what ifs to to. And Batman would be, I think, fairly boring if you could only tell one version of the story. I think they would have run out of material a very long time ago if if you could only tell one story. And so having the multiverse just creates a a richer and and more accessible character i think because he could literally be anybody and just the different writers who have written just the regular batman can prove that and then expanding that to to multiverse batmans just just creates a a plethora of batmen to choose from I agree. I haven't been reading Green Lantern just because Morrison's not really my thing and Green Lantern's not my thing. So put two things that are not my thing together and you have a thing that I'm not into. Surprise. However, I think that um, the idea of a Green Lantern Batman is particularly interesting to a lot of people because Batman himself is such a wish fulfillment, but he has no power. So the idea of giving Batman powers obviously is extremely exciting to at least some writers um, like Grant Morrison and Scott Snyder. Um, I personally don't really like the idea of Batman with powers. It's part of the reason I don't like Batman on the Justice League. But um, Steph is a million percent correct. Batman sells um, and DC wants more money. And I can't blame them. I mean, I can't blame them for wanting to sell stories. I can't blame fans for wanting to see their favorite character in different circumstances. Um, but it's not for me. Yeah, and the other, kind of jumping back to what Steph said, let's also be honest, different versions of Batman mean you can create way more merchandise without <laughs> yeah. a lot of effort. And uh, that has to, that goes hand in hand. With some of that stuff, to be fair, that's not saying that any of the creators are sitting there going, you know what, I want a Batman of Zurian R so that I can have another Batman in the same exact action figure just painted differently. They're not obviously doing that, but it obviously doesn't doesn't hurt. So, um, your last question deals with what is some of your favorite Batman of the multiverse or doppelgangers? Elseworld Batmans or some of the Batman Incorporated characters. Um, very, very easily, I would say the Gotham by Gaslight Batman because I like the Victorian era kind of version of, of Batman um, where he doesn't have all the technology, but the stuff that he does have is still very advanced for the time frame. Um, that would probably be one of the ones I would say for Elseworlds. As far as Batman Incorporated characters, um, I always thought that um, the, there was a lot of room to really, really focus on some of the other ones, or like 
like certain characters got to focus. Like obviously Knight and Squire had a Knight and Squire mini series during when Batman Incorporated was going on the first time before the new 52. Um, they were fleshed out, but there was other characters like, uh, Knight Runner from France who had stories in two annuals that year, uh, right before the new 52. But then there was other characters like Dark Ranger and they had, uh, the El Gacho, which he was pretty fleshed out. But I think that Night Runner was kind of more interesting to me because he was very new to everything. Um, and that's not to say that some of the other characters weren't new to understanding, but it felt like a lot of the characters that were part of Batman Incorporated were more established characters that existed in their own countries or cultures or whatever. Night Runner was very new on scene. Like he would be like a, if you were bringing in a new ally, um, to the Bat family, and it was just somebody who was going out and doing stuff. Uh, you know, very similar to, you know, Batgirl in Batgirl Year One, where she's doing it on her own, and then she's brought into the fold, um, because she's, and, and she happens to be new to the crime fighting scene. Night Runner felt like that. I thought Night Runner could have been an, uh, you know, somebody who could have had a little bit more time focused on, um, favorite doppelgangers or multiverse Batman. You know, it's funny. My son actually asked me this a while back. He asked me, you know, if you had to pick a Batman, which one would be your favorite that's not the normal one? And I actually said uh, Zuran R. Batman because I think the color scheme is so crazy and out there that while I could care less about the, you know, the character behind it, the costume is really cool looking because it's just so different. So... Those are mine. I was going to say something similar to fa- fa- favorite elsewhere, which is just anything set in a period time. So like 40s Batman, um, yeah, Gotham by Gaslight. Those are all just really cool visually to just get a completely out there. What if, you know, it was he, Batman was born or Bruce was born, you know, 100 years earlier? What what would he how would he deal with the loss of technology? I just really love that that visual. Um, and favorite like Elseworlds or doppelganger? Like I don't know. I I'm very intrigued by Owl Man. Like whether it's like evil Bruce or or you know Bruce's younger brother or or whatever. It's the idea of well, what if this genius had gone bad? What if what if you know, Bruce decided that he was angry instead of, you know, that he let his vengeance basically fuel evil. I don't know. It's, it's interesting seeing what, what would have come if Batman had gone bad. For me, the oh, Elseworlds I Batman I think I enjoyed the most was Pirate Batman. I think he was called <laughs> Leatherwing. Leatherwing. <laughs> and he was in two different stories, both by Chuck Dixon and I think the same artist. I think an Italian artist. And it was just so fun. And the storytelling was all like in poetry. And so it, w- it was a really enjoyable little Elseworlds Batman. Um, Catwoman was a... Yeah, Catwoman was a, another pirate. And there was that, yeah. that romantic tension that I'm a big fan of. <laughs> um, the, the Batman Incorporated character I enjoyed the most was uh, the Batman of Japan. Um, who showed up a bit in Batman Eternal. So that's part of why I like him, because that was a big part of why I came back to DC Comics after three years. So Batman of Japan had a really cool relationship with an anime girl who shrunk, and so he had to figure out a way to have a relationship with a girl who's 10 inches tall. And I just thought it was a fun blending of anime tropes and Batman. Um, The doppelganger or or sort of non elseworlds alternate universe batman i'm gonna say the drowned um as much as i hate uh dark knight's metal and i really hate dark knight's metal i think the idea of a female bruce wayne who still is batman and has a sylvester uh catman and then becomes aquaman because uh she's fighting uh atlantis i can't remember who was the aggressor in that war but I love the world building in that one shot, and I think she deserved more fleshing out than Batman Who Laughs, certainly. 
All right. So then our next question comes from Mattman via Discord. He says, I was thinking what character's last words would be if they were dying in Batman's arms. I think if Gordon was dying in his arms, he would say, it's okay, Bruce. I've always known it was you. What would you like to hear a character say that was dying in Batman's arms? <laughs> LOL. Then Gordon would say, but Batgirl, I can't f- figure out that one. Please tell me. Ha 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 ha. Um... If any of the Robins ever died in Batman's arms, any of his allies, I would like them to just say, uh, you know, uh, some, you know, something to recognize him as their dad, even though he's not their dad. Cause I think that would be a good moment. Not that I want any of them to die, of course, but if the, if, if you know, Dick Grayson was dying and Batman's there, you know, he says something like, instead of just saying, um, it's okay, Bruce. You know, he says like something like, it's okay, Bruce. You're always a great dad or something like that. That would be, that would be good. This is kind of cheating and I'm sure everyone knows I'm going to say this, but my favorite character did die in Batman's arms. And I really liked what she said um, in Stephanie Brown's death scene, which was later retconned to not be death, but she died at the time. So it totally counts. She said, was I ever really Robin? And Batman says, yes. And so she says, then I really was for a short time part of the legend. And that to me is my favorite dying in Batman's arms thing, just because it shows the power of who Robin and Batman are. I had problem taking this question seriously just because so many people die. So I think on the Discord I said, you know, they're thinking, or they say out loud, not again. (laughs) (laughs) I'm dying again. (laughs) I'll be back in a year. (laughs) Ugh, I don't know. I didn't really think about this question. I don't really have an answer. It's just, I do like, I like both your answers and, and I guess if I had to pick one thing, it would be because you know Bruce is gonna blame himself no matter what it is. Like if if you know Tim Drake was choking on a peanut, like Bruce would blame himself for for their death. And so I, I should have had the Heimlich ready. Should have had the Heimlich ready. Should have been ready. You know, it's like so, the kids or whoever it is would you know have to say, you know, I love you, and this is not your fault. And I don't think it would help. But at least to have the acknowledgement of the person before they die and you don't have that closure of them telling him it is not your fault. Because each one of these people has chosen to be in Batman's life and and to live this life. And so for Batman, he probably would feel so much guilt. And so them to just say, I absolve you. <laughs> All right. So that is all of our comments that we have from the last episode and the previous comments that we've had from before. Uh, so if you have a comment for the next episode that you'd like us to talk about or a question or a concern or a comment related to any of the books we talked about here, be sure to leave your comments either on the podcast post on the website. You can leave your comments on Discord, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, wherever you're listening or wherever you interact with us. As long as you tag us in it, we'll make sure we plug them in and we'll we'll talk about them on the next time around monkey watch 2017 i've got a real deep monkey watch question but i don't want you to think too much into it and i know that's like super contradictory but so here's here's the monkey watch question of the uh, of the episode you have to pick out of the following characters. Um, you have Dick Grayson, Tim Drake, Damian Wayne, Jason Todd, Barbara Gordon. Those are the those are the members you have to pick. So out of the five characters, one of them has to be taken off the board. Whether it be they are taken off by dying, whether they're taken off by a horrible situation like how Barbara was taken out of being backroll and ended up was confined to a wheelchair, but they can no longer be part of the bat family that goes out on patrol. Which member do you take and why? You need to go first. I'll go first. That's fine. Uh, so if I was currently picking a member out of those five, I would pick, uh, 
Batgirl right now because I feel like she's the most disconnected to the rest of the Bat family. And I say that fully knowing that they're all pretty disconnected, including and mostly Dick Grayson at this point. But when you look at the character where they're not in a year-long storyline, you have various versions of the character. And I think that Barbara for a really long time has been disconnected. Uh, the only connection within the last couple of years was when we had Batman and Robin Eternal and she was working with the Bat family. Occasionally you'll see them interacting, but I just feel like she's so outside. And if something like that was to happen, not I don't necessarily want her killed off, but if we put her back in the wheelchair or we just took her out from being Batgirl and she went to back back to being back uh, Oracle, she would be way more interconnected with not just the Bat family, but the other members of the DC Universe. Because I feel like that character has just been out on their own. While I could say the same about some other characters out there, she seems to be the least interacting with other characters and that could change eventually maybe birds of prey will change and she'll be part of that team instead of harley quinn that could always change after the film comes out or not we'll see um but i think that she's the most disconnected from a lot of the rest of the dc universe and bat family and i'd like to, her to be more connected so i think if she's less connected as Batgirl, we might be able to see that just based off of her past history. My reasoning is not going to make too much sense, but <laughs> so every one of those characters has had multiple masks, if you will. You've had Batgirl Oracle, you've had Nightwing, who's had quite a few different personas, uh, Red Robin, Robin, Tim Drake, and what was the other one? Oh, uh, uh, Red Hood, Robin. So Damien's really the only one that's only ever had one persona. Before he was Robin, he was just Damien. So as as counterintuitive as it would be for me to select Damien as my, because he's my favorite, I might pick him to see what else they could do with him. Because right now, he's not in detective comics, even though he should be. And he's in Batman, but everyone's in Batman now, I guess, a little bit. But I would not I would be Steph. interested to see what <laughs> not Steph. But I would be interested to see what what else they could do with him because as much as I love him, they seem to kind of not know what well they don't know what to do with any of the pet family members right now. But you know they don't seem to know what to do with him. So I would be interested to see what what new persona could could Damien have, and what what would that be. That's well, right. I like the idea that you saw sort of in Batman Beyond where he was uh, the demon's head, but the he tried, head, to, yeah. tried to lead them in a different direction. So he's not like his dad trying to wipe out all of humanity for environmental reasons or whatever. <laughs> I, I think that would be cool. Like stories where someone takes over an evil organization trying to make them less evil. I, I like those kinds of stories. Like Red Hood right now. Sort of. I'm so kind behind of. on that book. Um, I, I mean, I would pick the same person as Dustin Babs just because I think Oracle is a much cooler character than Batgirl but in the interest of providing uh, an interesting answer I would take Tim off the board um, but let him do something because last time we took him off the board he was stuck in a cosmic jail cell outside of the universe or something um, I'd love to see Tim doing something civilian going to college and having wacky detective adventures or something um so that, that's what I would do. I love Tim, um, but outside of Young Justice, where he's, again, outside the universe, um, he, he really hasn't had that much interaction. Um, so I, I'd be curious to see what they do if they were told, you, you can't have him be a superhero. He, he just has to be in a different context. Um, and I think he'd be cool at it. I think so, too. I think, you know, him solving crimes that are more down to earth could actually be well not that he's not i mean the problem is they don't really show him solving crimes now and he's supposed to be this great detective so yeah all right so that's monkey watch uh if you have a monkey watch question that you'd like us to ask be sure to leave your comments on the podcast and we'll get to those next time around 
I'm always open for suggestions. Otherwise, I literally try to find something or come up with something either right before we start recording or right as we're recording. So if you have something that's a little bit more in-depth that you'd like to talk about, be sure to leave your comment for the next episode. With that being said, that is everything for this episode. I want to encourage everyone to head over to the website for latest news related to movies, TV, merchandise, video games, and of course the comics. Also be sure to check out all the other podcasts that we have to offer. We have lots of other podcasts. They're always posting new episodes just in the past two weeks. We have a new Bat Books for Beginners. We have a new uh, Bat Fans. We have new uh, Batman books, The Dark Knight and Pros, Back with the Oracle, Robin Everyone Loves the Drake, uh, Everyone Loves Young Justice. Um, and Robin Everyone Loves the Drake is just about to post up their 100th episode, so be sure to check that out. Uh, be sure to check out all the stuff. There's, there's literally tons and tons of content that we're putting out all the time, whether it be news stories, articles, reviews, podcasts, there's all kinds of content so we hope that you enjoy our content you can help support us because you're enjoying our content or at least comment on the the content that we are putting out so outside of that be sure to follow us on twitter instagram facebook and youtube for all these news and videos from the batman universe we've gotten a little bit better about posting more content um, and spreading it out on social media so be sure to follow us on all those social media links outside of that you can always leave us reviews in itunes or any other podcast platform that you're currently listening to our podcast on those are always greatly appreciated and uh, outside of that you can leave your comments for the next episode anywhere you are listening to this and we will find it and answer your questions on the next episode with that being said that is everything for this episode this is dustin this is steph and this is ian And you've been listening to the Batman Universe Comic Podcast. We'll see you guys in two weeks.